Hallelujah. <laughs> Nobody wants to stay beaten to death in a ditch. All right. Turn to the Bible, 2 Kings chapter 18 tonight with me, please. Verse 5. 2 Kings. The Chronicles and the Kings of Israel. 2 Kings chapter number 18. And verse number 5. And we'll start reading verse number 1 to get a context of where we are. The scripture says, It came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign. He reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was, note carefully, right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, did. He removed the high places, break down the images, and cut down the groves, and break in pieces the brazen, brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. Father, I pray that you'd bless your holy word tonight. Anoint it as it goes forth, and anoint the messenger. In Jesus' name, amen. If you notice in verse number 5, this is a summation of what this man was. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him be among all the kings of Judah nor any that were before him. For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him but kept his commandments which the Lord commanded Moses. Notice that capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Printers type to tell you that this is Jehovah. They've changed his name today. A lot of people call him Yahweh. I stay with Jehovah. The reason I do is because of the Masoretic vowel points. The Masoretics are the ones who put that yod hey vow hey, seg hol, holam wow, and hama satuf. They put that on those four Hebrew consonants. And I'm going to stick with the Jews. Amen. But here in 2 Kings chapter number 18, we're talking about Hezekiah, the king of Judah. His name means strength of Jehovah. In plain words, Hezekiah is marked by his trust in and strength of the Lord. This makes him one of the best kings that Judah ever had. To give you just a little bit of historical uh, perspective, when David passed his kingdom to Solomon and Solomon eventually died, Solomon's son Rehoboam became the king of Israel. But he listened to the wrong counselors, and because he did, he heaped scorn and whip and rod upon the people, and they rebelled against him. And ten tribes went to the north and set up their own worship through Jeroboam. They had their own priesthood. It was a, it was a, it was a, uh, it was a fabricated, created thing. It was never ordained of God. But the reason that Jeroboam did this is so that he could keep these tribes away from Jerusalem where the temple was and where the true worship of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel was. So Jeroboam kept them to the north. So ten tribes stayed in the north and two tribes stayed in the south. And the tribes in the south were the tribes of Benjamin and Judah. And from then on the kings... From then on, the kings that ruled in the south were called the kings of Judah, and the kings that ruled in the north were called the kings of Israel. There is not one single place in the Bible that says any king of Israel was ever a good king. Not a one. They never had a good one. But Judah had some good ones, and Hezekiah is one of the best they had. He was a good man. He loved the Lord. He tore down the, uh, the, the groves and the and the monuments that had been erected to Ashtoreth and to the pagan gods and goddesses about them. And he rebuilt the temple of God, embellished it. And when I say rebuilt it, it wasn't destroyed, but he brought it back into its glory. And he brought the Passover back to the land, to the people, which, had been, which they had not been recognizing. And so, and, and so Hezekiah is doing everything right. He's doing all the right things. And for a while they watched him, as they always do. People are watching you. You say you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They'll say, okay, let's see if it makes a difference. 
in your life and my life. And that's just human nature. You say you trust in the Lord, then we'll see if you trust in the Lord. But the Bible says that he was the king of Judah. His father's name was Ahaz. Ahaz was one of the worst kings that they had. He was an idolater. He brought, he brought the sacrifices and all into Israel. And he raised, he raised up the places to Ashtoreth and all of that. And so he was a bad king, but his son was a good king. You don't have to walk in the footsteps of your fathers. The Bible says that he trusted in the Lord, 2 Kings 18, 5, so that after him was none like among him of all the kings of Judah. 2 Chronicles chapter number 29 says, in his heart there was a covenant made with the Lord God of Israel. So this was not superficial. It was not on the surface. It was real. Hezekiah's faith in Jehovah was real. His trust in God was real. It was not a facade. It was not a put on. It was not a lot of the stuff you see today for whatever purpose. Maybe I'll lead the people better if I profess to be religious. If I give them their religious observances back and clean up the temple and all of this, maybe I can get them to obey me and I'll be more prosperous. No, 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 no. Hezekiah was genuine in his faith and trust in God. And he restored the Passover. In 2 Chronicles chapter number 30 and verse number 6, here's quite a revealing thing. 2 Chronicles 30 verse 6. So the post, this is where we get our term postman or post office. A post is one who carries a letter. So the post went with the letters from the king, from Hezekiah, and his princes throughout all Israel and Judah. He went to the ten northern tribes and he carried a letter to them. According to the commandment of the king saying, here's what the king says to the ten northern tribes when he reinstituted the Passover. He gives them an invitation. He said, ye children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He said, and he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. That's a wonderful thing. You know what he's doing? He's trying to unite his people again under the true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. That's a good thing. That's an honorable thing. Hezekiah is showing his mettle. He's showing you that he's genuine in his faith, and he wants to bring them down. And remember, they were in the north, and they had raised up of the vilest of the people, a priesthood, had set up their own sacrifices, and all of this, and they were doing this so they could be separate from the, ten, from the two tri southern tribes of the south. God never moved his name from Jerusalem. He said, I put my name in Jerusalem. And he said, that is where you worship me. That is the holy mountain, the hill of God. That is Moriah. That is where Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice to God. That is where Melchizedek made Abraham when he came back from the killing, from the slaughter of the kings. It is holy, holy, holy unto the Lord God. You don't just jerk up that which is holy and move it around at your, at your pleasure, you know, and say, now, Lord, we invite you to be here. You know, Lord, we've chosen a different way of worship, and we think it's more, it's more, uh, it's more appealing to the people of today, and we're going to jettison all of the old paths and the old ways. We're going to throw them out. Now, come on home, Lord. <laughs> he doesn't work that way. If it's real, if it's genuine, and if it's good and it's right, God will bless it. And just because you think it's good and think it's real and think it's right and try to put your mark and expect God to bless it, don't expect him to do that because he's not bound to do it. The only thing God is bound to do is that which is holy, holy, holy. Here's what they did. The Bible says they laughed the messengers to scorn. When they sent these messengers into the north, the postman to carry the letters from the king, inviting them to come to Jerusalem and observe the Passover, you're our brothers and you're our sisters. We're all Israelites. Come down here and let's worship God together at the Passover. And you could not, you could not, you could not observe the Passover in the north. You could not observe it in Samaria. You could not observe it in Ekron or the Philistine land. The only place that you could observe the Passover was in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of the great king. So he said, come down here. And let's worship God together at the Passover. And the Bible said they laughed him to scorn. Now remember the geography. The ten northern tribes are in the north. And the southern tribes are in the south. When all this started back in the time of Abraham, there was a thing called the Fertile Crescent. The Fertile Crescent is like a crescent moon. 
It's shaped like this. It goes from the valley of Mesopotamia, which is the, uh, the, high, the Tigris and Euphrates River, Ur of the Chaldees, where Abraham came out of. When he came out, he went north. He went to Haran. There his father died. Then he went on down to the south into the land of Israel. Well, underneath this fertile crescent, underneath it, is desert. It's desert land. If you want to stay away from it, if you can, because back in those days, they didn't have 747s. They had to have water. So they traveled from the north down into the south. That meant that when the enemy came, the enemy would come down upon them from the north. He would come down upon them like a flood. And so when the Assyrian that was their enemy at this time, and then later the Babylonians, they had formed a league with the Egyptians, but all of these things were just, you know, how leagues are and how, and all of this, he's, he's working for their own. The Assyrian was a, was a very, if you go back and look at some of the reliefs that you can see, and, you, and they're still around today, it shows the Assyrians impaling people on stakes and carrying their bodies around. It shows the horrific way they treated their enemies. They were vicious people. It struck terror into the hearts of anyone to know that the Assyrian was coming and he was going to assault them. And the Assyrian at this time was the enemy of Israel. And so Hezekiah that served the true and living God, that had brought the Passover back into the land, that had kicked Ashtoreth out and all of her idols and all of her fertility, sexual rights, the Sodomites that went with it. There's a whole slew of stuff. Kicked all of that out and had elevated once again the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. It all looked good. This is beautiful. If you walked in Jerusalem and you walked among the people, you could hear them singing. You could hear those men and singing on top of Moriah. You could, they were singing. That's the way they worshiped God. If you go to Psalm chapter number 120, you'll look, it says, Song of Degrees. The 119th Psalm, which is the one right before that, has every letter of the Hebrew alphabet. How many ever noticed that? It's got all the letters of the Hebrew alphabet before every verse. All right? It's an acrostic. Then you go to the 120th Psalm. It's called a Psalm of Degrees. What's that? That is Hezekiah putting psalms to paper about your approach to God, about going up the steps as you go up to the top of Moriah. You see, it doesn't make any difference where you come from or who you are. If you're going to approach God, you're going to go up. <laughs> Amen. You're going to go up. And anywhere geographically that you're in the Holy Land, it makes a difference you're at the top of Hermon, which is much higher than, 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 than the mountain of Moriah. Hermon is the largest by far mountain in that area anyway. But it makes no difference. If you go to Jerusalem, you go up to Jerusalem. And the reason you do is because the city of the great king. So everything's in place. He's brought the sacrifice. He's brought the Passover. He's kicked out the devils. He's renewed the faith in God. He's preached to the people. He's told them that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel is the true and living God. Then he offers to the people in the ten northern tribes in the north, said, come down, my brothers and my sisters. We can come in here and we can have the Passover together. And we, should, we can worship the Lord. You're my flesh. You're my bone. You're my brother. You're my sister. And they were. They were. And they laughed him to scorn. So the time is going to come. The time is inevitably going to come where God proves himself to be the God of Hezekiah and he had a way of doing it. And it shows up in the text. And when you follow along with it, you begin to understand what's going on here because we have some forces arrayed against each other. In 2 Chronicles chapter number 30, verse 20, the scripture says, The Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. That word hearkened means he listened. You know, in the Old Testament, it says that he let none of his words fall to the ground. Have you ever re read that? I know you've read it if you, if you read the Bible. He let none of his words fall to the ground. In other words, empty, vain verbiage. You know, boisterous talk that is empty and vain. We got a lot of that. <laughs> we got it today. Nothing's changed about human nature. Empty, vain words. But if it is the word of God coming forth from the mouth of a believer... There's power in that. For the Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Hezekiah's words did not fall to the ground. Now, Hezekiah had a good friend during his reign as the king, and his good friend was Isaiah the prophet. I'd like to have a friend like that. Amen. Ain't no mistake about it. Amen. Isaiah, the Isaiah preacher that wrote the book. Yeah, that man. 
That was a good friend of Hezekiah the king. And they talked with each other. They communed together. And Hezekiah, uh, Isaiah, trusted Hezekiah. He believed in him. He believed that his faith was real. And, of course, we know that Isaiah was a prophet and that Isaiah did not receive his vision, his word, or his direction from man. Isaiah was a prophet of God, folks. He received it from the Lord. They call him the prince of prophets. I don't get into a lot of that stuff. One prophet, a prophet's a prophet. But anyway, this man Isaiah was a good friend of Hezekiah the king. That shows you what a good king Hezekiah was. He was a good king. And the Bible says that the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. He removed the high places. But I want you to notice 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4. This is a very revealing thing. I just read it to you, but let's read it again. 2 Kings 18, verse 4. He removed the high places, break the images, cut down the groves, and break in pieces. Now, hold on a minute now. The brazen serpent that Moses has ma had made. Now, what are we talking about here? You remember the Bible? You remember your history? Where did this show up? You remember the 40 years they spent wandering in the wilderness because they refused to believe it, Kadesh Barnea? And then for the next 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness. It was 40 years of graveyards. And then they were bitten one day by the fiery serpents, and they cried out to God, and God said, raise a what? A brazen serpent on a pole. And all they had to do was look to that serpent. All they had to do was look, and they'd be healed. And many of them were healed, but many of them no doubt died. All right? Well, now think about this for a moment. Here's this brazen serpent, and these people knew that God had used this, and he had saved them with this, and so they kept it. They held on to it, and they laid it up probably in the temple in a safe place. And now at the time of Hezekiah, the meaning of this brazen serpent had changed. It was no longer the same uh, what it represented before. It's something's different about it. Notice what he called it. Look at this, Nehushtan. That's a Hebrew word, and it means the brass thing. Yeah, the brass thing. That's a word of contempt. In plain words, this thing that you are, that you have elevated to a point of worship, has nothing to do with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. This is idolatry. But yet it had been a good thing. Are you watching the lesson in this? Something that had been a good thing now has devolved into a bad thing. Are you following me tonight how that, that things can devolve? They can go down instead of up. The God that I serve tonight is an invisible being. I can't touch him with my hands. I can't do that. I don't need something that I can touch with my hands because if I get something I can touch with my hands, then I will begin to look at that thing differently than I should. And this happens. It happens to a lot of people. It's happening today. They create idols out of something that at one time had been good. Now, this is another message in itself, but I just want to leave this with you tonight. I want you to think about Nehushtan. And Hezekiah, having spiritual discernment, was the first one to step in and say, No, 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 no. We don't need the brass thing anymore. Let's get rid of it. And they got rid of it. They took it and they got rid of it. They got rid of Nehushtan. So he had spiritual discernment. He loved the Lord. He was a faithful leader of Israel. He was a king that tried to unite his people again under a common, under a common faith. And the ten tribes in the north no doubt were uh, rebellious because once you begin to worship a false god, it begins to take hold of you and, and you're bought by it. it. It owns you. And this is what happens to people. And this is what happened here. They were worshiping a false god. So the scripture says, the thing of brass, they got rid of it. Isaiah the prophet, the prophet of God, was the, was the, uh, was the, uh, was the man of God of that time. Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah the prophet. All right, we'll pray for you, son. Isaiah was the prophet. He was the prophet of God. All right, he was God's man for God's people at this time. Just pray about this, folks. This is 2017. Everything's changed. Y'all understand that, don't you? This is not 1950. 
This is 2017. This is why I tell people I minister to my generation. Are you following me? We had good men 50, 60 years ago that got up and preached to people. They ministered to their generation. You live in perilous times. You've got to understand that. And you've got to be prepared. All right. So Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah the prophet, and he is the friend of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah has done everything that he should do, and God has blessed him. But now it is about time to put them to the test. Here in the book of Isaiah, uh, over here in Isaiah chapter number uh, 28, we have a kind of a mockery going on. Isaiah chapter number 28 and verse number 1, verses 1 through 11. I won't read all of it, but here's what's happening. Isaiah is telling the people, listen, God wants to talk to you. God wants to minister to you. God wants to help you. And the mockers and the scoffers were then as they are today. We still have mockers and scoffers, right? <laughs> How many of you are awake tonight? <laughs> okay. We got mockers and scoffers today as they had them then. All right. And they mocked and they scoffed. And notice what he said over here in Isaiah chapter number 28. And look at verse number 7. Isaiah 28, 7. But they also have erred through wine and through strong drink. They're out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. This is a rebuke of the teaching priesthood and of those who should know better. It is a rebuke of the leadership. Now look what they do. Look what they do. Whom shall we teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? There, if you read this text carefully, it gives you the impression that Isaiah has said something and they're replying. And it's almost like verse number 9, they're mocking the prophet. And notice how they're mocking him in verse number 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line. Here's what they said. These people that were mocking the prophet Isaiah, they were saying, Oh, okay, you're such a great teacher. You're so wonderful. Then the ones who have just been weaned off of milk, then you're going to teach them. And look how you're going to teach them. You're going to teach them line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. In plain words, the teaching of the scripture is line upon line, precept upon precept. The doctrines that the Apostle Paul talked about in the book of Romans, he said, when you should have been able to teach others also, you have need to be taught the first fruits of the doctrines of Christ. You have need to be taught yourself. This idea of learning is built upon learning, which is built upon learning, which is a slow process. So they're mocking Isaiah and they're saying, oh yeah, you claim to be a prophet of God. You claim to know so much, but look at you. You can't teach anybody except babies that have just been weaned. And by teaching them, the only way you can teach them is rote, 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 rote memory, rote memory, rote memory. Where are you going to get with that? Why should we believe anything you have to say, Isaiah? That was it. You'll always have a group that does not like to be taught. And they don't like to be, they don't like authority. They don't like responsibility. They like to be footloose and fancy free. So now we've got the, we've laid the foundation for what's about to happen. We read over here in uh, Isaiah chapter number 22, verse number 15, that Ahaz had died and Hezekiah had counselors around him. Isaiah 22, 15. Any king, like our president, he has a cabinet, right? He has counselors around him. A smart man will surround himself with smart men. <laughs> or women. And like I say, if you won't use another man's brains, it's a good indication you don't have any of your own, right? <laughs> I mean, that's true. On the surface of it, it's true. But here's the problem. 
Hezekiah, uh, uh, Hezekiah's counselors, some of them were from his father Ahaz. His father Ahaz was a reprobate, godless man who had surrounded himself with counselors that were compromising and worldly and wanted to make alliances with all of the powers around them and did not stand for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. They'd accept any God as long as it's convenient. Anybody like that today? They'd gathered themselves around Ahaz. Ahaz had gathered his cabinet. When Hezekiah becomes the king, he inherits some of his father's cabinet. One of them is Shebna. Shebna. Now look at what it says over here in Isaiah chapter 22 and verse number 15. Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Go get thee unto this treasurer, even unto Shebna, which is over the house, and say, What hast thou here, and whom hast thou here, that thou hast hewed thee out a sepulcher here, as he that heweth him out a sepulcher on high, and that graveth an habitation for himself in a rock. So what's that mean, preacher? There's a good indication that Shebna was not a Jew to begin with. That he was a transplanted Assyrian or something like that. Can understand how, how, how uh, his father, Ahaz, had gathered from other places counselors, made alliances. You remember when Solomon was the king of Israel? Do you remember that he married Pharaoh's daughter? That put him in good with Pharaoh, remember? This kind of thing has been going on for a long time. He has, uh, <coughs> Isaiah the prophet rises up and says about Shebna and about his counsel to Hezekiah, which was worldly and it was no longer the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel being separate, 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 the Holy One of Israel, that it's okay for us to bring in the gods of the heathen around us to make peace with them so that we can live. Isaiah said, you're trying to hew out yourself a sepulcher, a place in Israel, a home among people that are not your people. That's what he said to him. That's what this is talking about. There are those who came out of Egypt, and the Bible says they had a mixed multitude. Remember that? You remember reading that? That mixed multitude means that for whatever reason, many of the Egyptians followed the Israelites out of Egypt for personal gain, had vendettas or whatever. They followed them out. And when they got out into the wilderness, what happened? First thing happened when Moses was on top of that mountain and Aaron was in charge of the people, what did they do? First thing they did, they did what? Exactly, to apis the bull. This is what happens when a mixed multitude tries to worship God. Worship of God is a spontaneous thing. It can happen anywhere at any time. You say, preacher, we worship on Sunday. Well, you're in bad shape then. What's wrong with Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday? Well, Monday's the day of the Lord. You mean, I mean, Sunday's the day of the Lord. You mean Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday's not? They're all his day. Does it say this day? What's it say in the Bible about the day of the Lord? What's it say? To, this is the day the Lord hath made. It's his day. He owns it. He owns it all. So you're not limited to a place or a time to worship God. It's spontaneous. Have you ever noticed a generation like we have today, though, that worship has to be orchestrated, everything has to be led exactly right, everything has to be crossed, all the jots, all the tittle, exactly the right kind of music, exactly the right kind of worship leader and all of that? You are in a theater. That's not the church of God. Worship is spontaneous. It comes from the soul. It comes from the spirit. And the only person who can truly worship God, folks, is one who's born again or is a real believer. So he said, you have no part in here. Now we get down to why this is all important. In 2 Kings chapter number 18, verse 28, the Bible said, Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, 
Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. <coughs> Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in Jehovah. See that? That's arrogant. That's blasphemy. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Now we're coming to the nitty-gritty. This is what it's all about. It's a wonderful thing to have wonderful worship services, the truth of God, to clean up the land, to have a good king, to have people singing on the top of Moriah, to have all of that going on. That's a wonderful thing, folks. But when it comes time for your enemy to come to your gate and your enemy to declare that his God is greater than your God, and when you have a confrontation between gods, I'm going to tell you something tonight right now. There's only one Lord God. There's a lot of gods out here in this world now. The floodgates have been opened. Every kind of a god you can imagine is out here, and he has his followers, or she. I see goddess all the time on bumper stickers. The goddess or the god, whichever one. It makes no difference. Choose whichever. It doesn't make any difference. They're all the same. But there's only one true and living God. And God's about to show himself. He's about to prove himself in Israel. He's going to prove. And this over and over this happens in the Old Testament. When Elijah went to the top of Carmel and he met those prophets of Baal, he said, let the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And foolish enough, they, got, they took it. <laughs> they, they took the challenge. Then the Bible said they jumped up and down to the noon hour and they gushed the blood, gushed out of them. They cut themselves as the Bible said, as was their manner. Oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal, hear us. Baal couldn't hear him. Baal's dead. And Elijah, was, he was amused. Because he knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob could hear him. And he did hear him. And that's what happens here. That's what happens here. Isaiah chapter 37, verse 33. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. He's come across the fertile crescent. He's come down from the north. He's already come through the northern tribes that mocked and made fun and laughed to scorn when Hezekiah invited them to come to the Passover. They were the first ones to go. See? They were the first ones to go. They'd already taken them. Rabshakeh stood outside the walls of Jerusalem and said, Look, your brethren are gone. We've carried them off. We've taken their cities and burned them. It's all over with. The great king of Assyria, I stand for him. And Hezekiah and Isaiah knew exactly what was going on. They knew it was a confrontation between the true and living God and a pagan piece of garbage. So here is what we read. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians an hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. He wiped out an army. A hundred and eighty-five thousand troops is an army. Division strength, something like fifteen thousand. 20,000, you're looking at 185,000 troops. This was a huge army that had besieged the city. And one angel of the Lord moved in their midst, and he brought death and destruction on every one of them. One angel, one angel of God. You're living in the time when the power of God Almighty is going to be challenged, and the God of this world will have the audacity to try to meet him in battle because he is so deceived. He is so deceived. This is what the battle of Armageddon is about. The word Armageddon literally means the mountain of Megiddo. R in Hebrew is mountain. Megiddo, Armageddon, the mountain of Megiddo. I told you this morning about Megiddo. 23 levels of civilization creates the tail Megiddo. You stand on the top of it and look at the valley of Esdraelon. If you look right across the valley of Esdraelon to the other side, and I've been there, you go to the other side of the Valley of Esdraelon and go up a hill, guess what town you find? Nazareth. And that's where the Lord Jesus Christ grew up. Nazareth. 
And it was there that they were going to cast him down. Remember? They came against him and they were going to cast him off of this cliff. Down into the valley of Esdraelon. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision it's called. The great battle of Armageddon. I think we're close to it. I think we're very close. And I'm going to tell you something tonight. I don't know what's going to happen to me tonight or tomorrow. I don't know. You saw what happened tonight, didn't you? Some of you may not be aware of it, but something happened tonight. I don't know, folks. But I'm going to cast my lot with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. That is the one I cast my lot with. That's the one I'll stand for and, if need be, die for. Is the God of and Father of my Lord Jesus Christ. We're going into a dark hour. We are soon approaching the battle of Armageddon. But there's also a light, and that light is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. He's coming again to receive us into himself, that where he is, there we may be also. So I look for his coming. Amen. And of course you can imagine, after this happened, what rejoicing they had in Israel. Now before that, Rabshakeh had come and he had besieged Israel once before. And they sent word back, and they inscribed it in a, in a box-like structure, about this long or so, that's got uh, uh, angles on, I don't know what you call it, an octagon, whatever it is. And it says in their language, I have shut up Hezekiah like a bird in a cage. There you have, written in secular history, the very reference to the king of Judah, which Sennacherib had shut up like a bird in a cage. Oh, by the way, you didn't read that part in there, did you, where he went back to the gods, the house of his gods, and he went in there and he started praying to his God, and his sons killed him? I didn't read that for you tonight. Yeah, his sons killed him, and then, and then, uh, and then, uh, and then one of the sons, Esarhaddon, uh, rose up as the king of, uh, of the Assyrians. Uh, his, his God didn't make it for him, did he? Your God will make it for you, my dear friend. This is the time you better get the right God. <laughs> you better get the right one. Because there's a lot of them out there vying for the throne. <laughs> Father, in Jesus' name, bless your word tonight. Bless it to the hearts of the people. Thank you for the promises that you've given us. I say tonight, Father, with all the believers, even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. In thy holy name I pray. Amen. All right.